So these are all new platforms that we're going to need to reverse engineer and work on. And when they say, oh, SEO is dead, well, we've heard that throughout our careers and it doesn't die. What happens is it evolves and it changes and old methods die and new ones are created. Again, if we remove the SEO from the definitions here, what are we? We are organic search marketers and organic means non-paid. So forget about the SERPs, forget about links. It's how are we going to appear in SGE? Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It's my pleasure to have Gareth Simpson with us. Gareth is the founder of Seeker Digital, an SEO specialist and outreach agency for e-commerce and SaaS. With 10 years of experience in SEO, Gareth has what it takes to put your website at the top of the search results and drive customers to your website. He helps define your strategy, audits and implementation, systems design, and develop your digital team. He does this every day for some of the world's biggest brands, delivering massive ROI on SEO spend. Gareth also teaches workshops on advanced link building for Brighton SEO, the biggest SEO conference in Europe. Gareth, it's so great to have you on the show. Hey, Stefan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we've known each other for a number of years. We got introduced by a mutual friend, Michael Janellis, co-founder of Pitchbox, which is an incredible SEO software specifically for link building outreach. And I know that's a tool that you use and, and my team uses as well. Do you want to comment on kind of the synchronicity of this quote unquote chance meeting of uh, Michael putting us together when we happen to be in the same city for an event and yeah, how that kind of uh, turned out? <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I really remember it was one of those light bulb moments for me when I received that email from Michael introducing us. I'd been reading your books. I learned technical SEO from yourself and your co-authors as well. So I was like, oh my God. And uh, yeah, Michael, uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's no secret that I'm a big fan of Pitchbox and it powers a huge part of our link building operation at Seeker. And uh, obviously Michael and Alex and uh, the Pitchbox team, you know, they know who their like power users are, I guess. And uh, I think you asked them for some link building recommendations and uh, Michael put us in touch, which was really, really fantastic news. And then I think we met in, you were speaking at Brighton SEO actually. And uh, we met there and then we had, we had brunch and yeah, it's been uh, six years ago now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We've known each other for six years now. Awesome. And, and uh, we've collaborated on shared clients. We've getting some coaching from me and we've been uh, just friends and colleagues over that time. It's been uh, such a, a, a joy and an honor to know you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, like saying it out loud, six years. We, I mean, we spent quite a lot of time together, especially with the, the coaching and mentoring, which has certainly helped me a lot, both with my agency and then unexpectedly, certainly with my personal life as well. So yeah, the feelings certainly mutual. Thank you. No, oh, that's awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. So if, if uh, you could share something that really excites you about uh, SEO or link building or AI or just technology, marketing, anything that is just something, you know, peeking out over the horizon for you and for all of us, what's jazzing you right now? I've been obsessive with links and building links and the whole spectrum of link building from the science to the creativity, the campaigns. I still enjoy running a campaign myself and that the endorphins I get from winning, winning a pitch or, or landing a, a really great placement that's, uh, you know, great for, uh, for one of my sites or my clients. And I, that's been my main focus professionally over, well, certainly the past seven years with Seeker, but uh, even before then I was really into link building. I think it's, I've been doing SEO now for 15 years. I started as a teenager and uh, invested so much time into learning it initially because I was, I was an SEO, a technical SEO, did the full spectrum of uh, work, but this, this one area of SEO, which I felt was the most important, but also the hardest and the thing I was worst at was link building. So then I got into the link building and uh, made an active decision to, to get better at it. And then that eventually then led into starting uh, Seeker as a specialist outreach agency. And I thought that would never change. Well, it, has, it certainly hasn't changed, but the artificial intelligence revolution has just got me so 
so enthused and so excited. That's my new thing. I'm so obsessed with it right now. Any content, any course, any experiments, service lines that I can roll out, I'm on it. I'm doing it right now. So I'm, I'm so excited about uh, what's to come, what's around the corner for uh, not only just the industry, but also just generally for, for society as well. Yeah. So it's like the fourth uh, industrial revolution or something. It's like, it's going to change everything. And of course, whilst revolutions have you know kind of gone like this, all of a sudden it's going to go like that, you know, and become very, very exponential, which is scary, of course. And there's going to be risks and threats that need to be mitigated and managed and things. And that seems to be what society is figuring out at the moment. But uh, I'm very much championing proper use and development of um, of this tech. Yeah. Yeah, for for me, the idea of being fearful about AI or even just worried about it is not helpful. Taking proactive, positive actions to help curb the potential negative influences of AI, that I encourage, of course, but losing sleep over AI doesn't help anybody. You know, my, my wife, Orion, has a great expression that worrying is praying for what you don't want. So why are you doing that? <laughs> why is anybody doing that uh, with regards to AI or anything else for that matter? And if we can just get into a place of trust that everything that's happening to us is actually happening for us, you know, individually and, and generally across all of humanity, and that the hand of God is behind everything that happens, absolutely everything, There's, there are no exceptions, then you can just kind of relax and know that you're being guided through uh, all of this, everything happening in your life. And then you can look for opportunities and ways to reveal light and do good through AI rather than just waiting for the other shoe to drop and some dystopian future, inevitable dystopian future to happen, like some horrible sci-fi movie that keeps you up at night. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you've just, uh, Reminded me of Mo Gordet's uh, book, um, Scary Smart, and he has three rules. Um, and I've, I've just tried to remind myself of what the uh, all of the three rules are, but certainly one of them is it's inevitable. I was watching the Lion King theatre a couple of weekends ago and seeing Timon and Pumbaa on stage singing Akuna Matata and yeah, about this stuff. It, you know, you can't change it. It's That's a great musical, by the way. I have seen it as well. One of the best for sure. So yeah, that lifted me up and we have to be optimistic and it's inevitable. So, well, I went through this when I first started experimenting with AI for link building campaigns and actually using some, not just GPT, uh, which still at the moment feels very much input, output, input, output, but that's, that's not really the, by far the full capabilities of this technology. It's when you go input and then it goes output and then it, outputs and outputs and outputs and it input, you know, it's prompting itself effectively and guiding its own, you know, agents controlling other agents. And I tried some, uh, some tools, some AGI tools, which like simulate artificial general intelligence, which of course we are so far away from, well, maybe not so far, but certainly that technology isn't mature yet, but certainly will be one day. And uh, I think we'll know about it when, it's, when it is. Some tools like uh, AutoGPT and Baby AGI uh, and things, and uh, they watching what they can do and putting in a prompt and said, my first prompt was, of course, make me a link building campaign for Seeker uh, for my website. I want, and I gave it a small objective, an outcome, not, not the steps, just, just delegated the outcome. And, uh, and then watching it kick into life. And it, it went on for hours. Like I just left it running and I kept working. I was, I was looking at it and then it started to write its own code for an email client, right? And I thought, oh my God, is it going to try and actually build an email client so it can, can start sending out each emails? And I thought, this was just an experiment. Like I, was, I, was only, I wasn't serious. Like just uh, where's the stop button? You know, I was like, is it actually going to be able to pull this off and actually start sending its own? And then it hacked into your LinkedIn and then it started sending LinkedIn connection requests. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So watching that, you know, I went through, sorry, to go back to to our point, is it the seven stages of grief? And one of the first stages is shock and disbelief. And a lot of people, I think, are going through that right now with, with AI. The resistance, the, the mistrust, which is totally, totally reasonable and understandable. 
but it's not AI that we need to trust or not trust. It's, it's the humans that control it and that are designing and what. Yeah. And that our AI is based on, right? So the, the bias that an AI has is based on the data set that it's using as, as the, uh, the training data. Yeah, exactly. So, so Mo in his book, he talks, talks about thinking of AI as a, um, a small, it's a child, a young child right now, and we can influence its development and how it's going to turn out uh, when it's when it's older, when it's more intelligent, and it's an adult. So if we we need to start caring, you know, about the influences and the inputs that we give this software, because of course it's then going to uh, to learn and replicate our our biases and our strengths and our weaknesses. And well, speaking of scary smart, a little kind of uh, analogy or not analogy, more like a corollary to that is being street smart about AI. And one great example I was just recently introduced to, the ChatGPT plugins, you really need to examine them to know what the heck they're doing. Yeah, exactly. And this is this is where some of that mistrust comes from and why we can't trust it right now in mission-critical applications and things for our clients and replace all of our SAPs with AI-based SAPs is because we don't know what, what's going inside, going on in that black box, you know, the processing. You know, generally what we want to do is audit and sense check softwares. Where it's like, you know, we have all these fantastic tools in SEO, but, and I'm very, you know, grateful and happy to use them, but I also know that I can always go back and really manually do the same same activity in, you know, using a crawler and uh, some, some spreadsheets and things and, and check the workings out. I know how the software is behaving, but, with AI, there's much more unpredictable. And also there are little things like this that could be built into the software, which advantage or disadvantage a certain person or group or brand. That's a problem that we don't know. Well, I don't certainly don't know how we're going to, to fix is, the, is those workings out. We're, we're seeing it with SGE as well. How where's it, where's it coming up with its answer? If we just had an output that said, we use these sources and you, these, these algorithms, et cetera, to come up with this, this answer that we might trust, you know, trust it a lot more. And the only thing I can think to do is, because I don't know if it's even technically possible to be able to reverse engineer how it's got its answer, but maybe there'll be an AI auditing tool that will try to, to do that for you. We can audit AI's behavior and it can tell us how it's come up with, with, with the answer so you know whether to trust it or not. Yeah, and, and just easy, quick move in that direction, you can ask ChatGPT to score in terms of validated uh, sources and accuracy of the information, the answer it had just previously given. You know, on a scale of one to 10, how accurate and validated is this information you just gave me and all the sources? Oh, it's a two out of 10. Oh, really? <laughs> Please now substantiate all claims that you made and provide uh, truthful information of the sources and everything for everything that you just gave me. And then, oh, okay, so you made a bunch of stuff up. Those are called hallucinations for those who are you know, familiar with, with that terminology. And just that's how LLM works. It just makes up the next word and the next word and the next word. And it may make something up that sounds really credible and true, but it's not. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Like um, when I was looking at this auto GPT experiment, is it actually doing these things or is it as simple as what's often often said? It's just predicting the most most likely words to come next uh, next in a string, which is how it can appear to be very intelligent. But that's not the GPT and chat GPT and LLMs aren't encompass the whole of AI. AI is so much bigger than that. So yeah, so I understand why some people are like, oh, you know, this is not going to change much or it's low quality work well it depends what you apply it to it's going to be low quality with certain things and then better quality it's going to be so much better at humans than at other things right and you know what you just described there with the hallucinations and things and having such a low integrity score on an on an output you have to put all of that into your prompts don't you you know um, I've, I've heard you talk on the podcast before about really large prompts and uh, every time it does something wrong or uh, or it hallucinates in some way, you have to go back and add that to your prompt. Don't do this, don't do this, or behave in this way. And then over time, you really start to narrow down its flexibility and what it will go out there and do until it's doing exactly what you want in the way that you want it to do it.
Right, right. You can confine or constrain the output to even just be like web browser output. Uh, we were discussing this before uh, recording, and I probably covered this on a previous episode, like with uh, Peter Swain, but the, the super prompt from Brian Romley that he gives as, as an example, it's a hypothetical or theoretical web browser of the the entire corpus that GPT-4 uses. And you would have, let's say, your input after you've supplied the website address and the year, the theoretical year that you're browsing. And then you start selecting links by just providing the number next to the link. And with a long enough, what uh, Brian Romley calls super prompt, that encompasses everything and constrains the output enough that this becomes really workable, you can be surfing websites into the future using ChatGPT now. It's pretty wild. <laughs> That's very creative, uh, very creative use, very impressive use of uh, AI. Sounds super fun and also could be super helpful for a lot of things. So, so I'll, I'll include in the show notes the link to further information from uh, this particular super prompt uh, from Brian Romley, who's an incredible AI researcher. He was on Jordan Peterson's podcast, a couple hour long episode. That's phenomenal. Highly recommended for those who haven't listened to it yet. Also, I'll include the link in the show notes to that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a brave new world. It's a very exciting time to be alive. Reminds me of the old Chinese curse. Uh, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> We certainly are. Yeah. So so let's talk about AI specifically in relation to link outreach, you know, because link building is a very big discipline. Link outreach is an aspect of it. Pitchbox, which we uh, spoke very briefly about at the beginning, is, a, I think, an essential tool for link outreach. There's more to link building than just the outreach. You have to create remarkable content, what some SEOs refer to as skyscraper content. There's a lot of other stuff to do in the strategy and planning and so forth. But for doing the outreach part, Pitchbox is an essential tool. How does AI come into play with uh, specifically the outreach portion, maybe even just Pitchbox specifically? Yeah, this is like, yeah, bringing it back to the here and now, to the present and how we can use the, the current AI technologies um, uh, in our work and in our everyday lives. Working on every day and actually have been since 2019 or 2018, actually, I always enjoyed learning about AI in the future and uh, technology, of course. So back in 2019, I hired an AI developer to come and work at Seeker. Um, I've also, over that time, uh, hired an ex-Amazon engineer who worked on language models at Amazon to consult for me and, and guide me. And that was in 2019. And I built some really cool stuff, very like, you know, proof of concept. And I, I talked about some of this at Brighton SEO and so on. And actually some of those tools that I've built have been in use at Seeker internally for a while, but some of the things that I wanted to try and achieve just weren't possible uh, back then. And actually I was using Pitchbox as the whole, um, the platform, the, you know, what something I love about Pitchbox is the APIs and the integrations that it got, uh, that it's got. So even if it hasn't got a feature that you want, you can go and just build it on top of the, um, on, on top of the platform yourself. So for example, back in 2019, I realized that our research team, the research team's job were to find the contacts at a specific website. Who's got the keys to the website so that we can send our pitch, our guest post, our press release, our campaign of some sort to offer them some value of, of some sort in exchange for a placement on their website. Now, that research element is super important, but also quite boring, laborious. There was, I think there was quite, quite a high turnover of, of staff on that team. And I understand why it's boring work. I don't mind doing a little bit myself every now and then, you know, if I'm running a small, very targeted campaign, but when you're doing it for a whole agency on mass all day, I can see how that's boring. So started to inc incorporate, uh, so I built my own custom scraper um, and I hooked it up with monkey learn, which helped to use uh, summarize. Well, um, 
recognize job titles. So I'd input the sort of job titles that I would want and then any variations of those titles, you know, let's say it was editor or head of marketing or writer or somebody at that website who's, who's going to be interested in our, um, in our link pitch of some sort. I wanted to extract those people automatically, then use Clearbit and um, Rich Contact. Is it Rich Contact or Full Contact? And Hunter.io, those sort of enrich data enrichment tools to then find their LinkedIn profiles, uh, a little bit about them, and then pipe that information into Pitchbox. Now, that was a very effective method of speeding up the outreach process and also take my, uh, you know, the poor team who are there doing this mundane work all day uh, to take them away from doing that. Yeah, because otherwise you're you're using a tool like Hunter.io to find LinkedIn profiles and email addresses, but then you're copying and pasting and then you're using the next tool and then you're copying and pasting there and then the next tool. So you connect all the dots together and uh, not have to use like Zapier uh, zaps to connect all of them. You can just use an AI to take control of that overall process. Yeah, exactly. Or Zapier is brilliant for just uh, prototyping stuff out. Uh, it, the problem is it gets expensive after a while. If you really want to scale this out, then yes, going to, going, uh, having it coded manually direct direct integration a custom integration uh, is going to save a lot of money and actually this was some of these things that i tried i had to stop because the scale just burned through so many api credits because i wanted some like auto autopilot link building tools basically and uh, you'd hit run and it'd go and scrape all these sites and enrich all these contacts and then i'd be left with a massive bill at the end and if you didn't much like prompting if i didn't have the targeting just right i've just gone and paid for a load of data that i've got no use for so that's one of the, you know, the, um, something that's uh, super cool about some of the latest pitch box things that have just come out. And I've just had a sneak preview of some of their AI features, which are super cool. They've baked all this stuff in now into natively into the platform. So at no extra cost. So yeah, they've got open AI integrations, uh, their own custom tuned models, you know, because they've got years of outreach data that they've, they've uh, at their disposal. And yes, Probably any link builder, the first thing they did when they went to ChatGPT, like me, was write me an outreach template. And what it produced, I was like, it's pretty good for a first first run. It's a bit generic. And of course, then a lot of that, um, so a lot of the outputs can be generic because it's trained on the World Wide Web. That's not necessarily always going to be the best source of knowledge uh, to train a model on, which is the beauty of being able to tune your own models, which is what Pitchbox have done on their outreach emails. They've run giant data studies on uh, characteristics of outreach emails that work well. And I know they've done some really great collaborations with, um, with BB, uh, who is a brilliant, absolutely brilliant link builder. Many reasons why she's a great link builder is because of her humor and her charm that she puts into outreach emails, which breaks the mold. It's, a, it's that pattern interrupt in sales. Yeah, so they've got, they've got a Gold mine of uh, knowledge there, and they've tuned their own models, and now they've hooked that up to Pitchbox, and now anybody can write really great outreach emails, which is great because anyone can write good, great outreach emails, but also it's not so great for you know link builders. Well, it depends how you look at it, of course. What what's happened is the bar is just raising, it's getting higher. Before that's all you needed was a great outreach email, and they thought, great, this person's confident because they're using humor. Uh, I like confidence. That makes me feel reassured about their value proposition because if they, if they believe in it, then I believe in it. It's well written. So I know they're a good writer. Uh, they've learned about me. They've personalized the email. They've, they know what books I'm into or what, what conference I spoke at or what are, they know about our latest investment round. And that breaks the, you know, that, that sentiment there. Uh, you know, we're all sucker for, um, well, I certainly am for, if something's been really personalized, I think, okay, I'll give you the time of day. I'll, let, I'll listen to your pitch just because you've spent that much time uh, perfecting it. But if it, if I feel like I'm being templated, you just, you know, we, we're all just blind to that now. A great example of this, by the way, is if you take the principles of influence, Dr. Robert Cialdini wrote the book Influence, which is an incredible, timeless book. He was a guest on this podcast, by the way, incredible episode. One of his seven principles of persuasion of influence is unity. So if I were to say, hey, just happened to notice that uh, you went to University of Michigan as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, I went there in such and such year and, you know, we just missed each other. By the way, I, I'd, I'd love to contribute an article on X, Y and Z. 
that unity principle really works, but you can't scale that until now using a tool like ChatGPT incorporated into the uh, the pitch process. It's really quite amazing. Yeah, exactly. So we can scale out that level of care for each prospect, but is that a good thing? I guess that's subjective, but certainly what it means is you have to get better. We have to get better. At like Just having good outreach emails is not going to be enough. So we, we now have to find that next competitive advantage to standing out because, yeah, you can scale out that personalization because each email can be unique with using Pitchbox and GPT tech uh, technologies. So It's really exciting. And, and I'm so impressed with the team at Pitchbox for taking on board suggestions that you came up with and baking that into the core product. Yeah, the, we, you know, we often hang out and just have calls in the evening and we geek out on link building. I learn from them. Hopefully they you know, learn, learn from me too. And we, we just, uh, yeah, we just, just have lots of fun because it's, um, it's just it's, it's a big, it's a fun game. You know, link building is a fun game, which I, 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 enjoy, uh, I enjoy doing. So, um, yeah, and they're, they're super, yeah, rolling out lots of really cool stuff. Yeah, and and you, you were really at the uh, in the early days there, at the cutting edge of things. I remember, uh, I I didn't attend that presentation, but I remember you you and I speaking about it. The one that you made you made at uh, Brighton SEO in 2019. <laughs> I love the title, by the way. You're so clever, uh, LMFAO, <laughs> leveraging machines for awesome outreach. That was really clever. Yeah, you remember. Yeah, you coached me on it. Yeah, that was that was my first big, one of my first uh, big conference um, talks. So um, yeah, so I basically come back and I've uh, I parked it all for a little while. The pandemic, etc. The R and D and this technology had to uh, had to be paused, and I had to focus on on the agency instead of thinking, uh, you know, in the here and now, instead of thinking five, ten years ahead. Now, actually, a lot of these ideas that I was trying to do is much more accessible now. It's cheaper, it's easier, and and actually much much better and more powerful. So I'm back at it again, uh, conducting R and D, seeing how I can use AI to automate SEO tasks. Um, you know, primarily link building right now, but also just just generally with like building sites, programmatic SEO. Actually, I've won off. I've won my first ever AI consultancy gig, which has been super fun. Just advising everything I learn. It gives me a focus as well. Everything I learn, I'm speaking to a CMO at a very big, very big organization. He just wants to talk to me on a weekly basis uh, because he's at the top of this organization and he wants to know, he wants all of the AI knowledge and things to be condensed down so that he can apply that to his planning for the future and the threats and the opportunities that it poses. Yeah, that's awesome. And and uh, speaking at conferences and Brighton SEO being a, a, a really big opportunity that started for you in like 2019 or so, I, I, I recall us talking about how the social proof of that could be further leveraged and, and the other conferences you speak at too, not just Brighton SEO. And uh, you, yeah, you took that on board. I, I remember finding a photo of you from, I think it was Chen Mai's SEO, the Chen Mai SEO conference or something. And you, it's a picture of you and the entire audience. You're on stage, you, you're, you're speaking to hundreds of people. And I'm like, you got to use that image. That's incredible social proof. You've, uh, and it's, uh, I just noticed it's on your homepage, on, uh, your personal homepage on garrisimplin.co.uk. Good job. <laughs> That's a great photo. I think um, more photographers should do that. Come up on stage and go over the shoulder and take a photo of the, of the audience. It makes for a fantastic shot. Yeah. But you know, the, most of these photos of speakers, like professional speakers, it's just them on stage. And it's, that, that doesn't show that there's a huge audience wrapped, uh, you know, wrapped attention. Yeah, exactly. Such a, such a great photo up. Yeah, yeah, super cool. So another thing I want to uh, kind of call out is, is an awesome thing that you've been talking about placements, not so much about links. And I love that, that, that this is PR, digital PR that you're talking about. And a lot of the folks who are in the link building industry are just talking about the link. And, and, and so when you earn a placement, you have a different mindset about link building than if you are trying to maneuver into 
uh, getting a link. One person's acquiring a link and they're going to have a different mindset and intentionality and pitch and approach and follow-up process versus somebody who's trying to win or garner a placement. And I, I just, I really uh, want to uh, acknowledge you for that. That's really, I think, a, a, a very forward-thinking way to look at link building. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's an important distinction to make because there will come a time where the link doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, we're already seeing it now. The way we search is changing. Our, our behaviors, the platforms that we use to uh, retrieve information is changing. I mean, Apple Vision Pro, I watched the, watched the keynote of that and I think, how is this going to change search? Well, those interfaces, mixed reality, et cetera, are going to hugely impact the way we behave, the way we search on, online. And even thinking of voice interfaces as well, uh, talking to Alexa or Siri or whatever, uh, future voice models and things, even, uh, who is it? Is it BMW or Mercedes has integrated uh, ChatGPT into their cars, into the dashboard? So you can talk directly from, from your vehicle. So these are all new platforms that we're going to need to reverse engineer and work on. And when they say, oh, SEO is dead. Well, we've heard that through the whole of our, you know, throughout our careers. And it doesn't die. What happens is it evolves and it changes. And old methods die and new ones are created. Again, if we remove the SEO from the definitions here, what are we? We are organic search marketers. And organic means non-paid. So forget about the SERPs, forget about links. It's how, how are we going to appear in SGE? If I ask SGE to write a, a tailored itinerary for a vegan guest that's joining me here in Bristol for, uh, for a few days, we'll be working with our clients to make sure that their restaurant is included in that itinerary. Oh, you know, if your friend is vegan... You know, let's say the prompt, the output says, if your friend is vegan, we highly recommend this vegan burger joint, for example. So now we have to think about how do we reverse engineer that? How, how did the LLM include that restaurant in the output? So then we have to look at the signals that it's using. And the signals aren't going to be clearly defined ranking factors like we used to talk about. 200 ranking factors, as they used to say back in the day, uh, it will use the signals available that it deems most fitting for the situation. That's unsupervised machine learning, isn't it? So yeah, it, it may not even use links in that scenario, or maybe it will. Um, it's much like the no-follow attribute now that has now... We'd stopped caring about those a long time ago, well before Google announced, was it like a year or two ago, that the nofollow attribute is now just a, it's an indicator. It's an optional directive. So for example, if we land a placement on a giant media site for our clients and it's nofollow, is that link still valuable? Of course it is. If it, if all being true. Even if it's not a link at all, it's just a mention of the brand, that unlinked mention can still be incorporated into the rankings criteria that, that Google's using. Exactly, yes. And that's um, just the mention there, just uh, that you're, you know, you're contributing, you're feeding the, the entity there of that people, place or thing. That's, we won't need the links. I remember I worked, a head of SEO of mine, when I worked for an agency, yeah, 10 years ago, talked to me about the linkless web. And I was like, my mind was blown back then. I was like, we won't use links. There'll be no Google will just be able to understand that this brand has been mentioned in this local roundup of best vegan burger joints or whatever it is uh, in Bristol. So, yeah, we don't necessarily even need the link in future. Obviously, right now we do. And it's if we've got the option to take it or leave it, we should take it because also there's other reasons to have links. It, that's how we navigate. They're the bridges. Although in the future, I could see a time where the personal AI that I use as the user takes over and either o overrides a link with a new link so I can navigate the, with my preferences of the kinds of uh, sources of truth and data, or if it's an unlinked mention, my personal AI could turn that into a link so I can click on it anyways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the personalization is going to be big, isn't it? Based on your behaviors, your your, you know, very basic things like search history, but then also all of the the biometrics and things that these uh, that our phones have and our smartwatches, etc. 
Um, so yeah, it goes back to that transparency is very important because that's a, a lot of power, which requires a lot of responsibility. Of course, we need to be able to trust for a good reason, the uh, personal AI that we use, that it's not feeding its, its data that it's collecting on me. It's not part of the public web. That it's not feeding that to some big repository or, or the government or whatever. Well, hopefully people vote with their feet and we'll, uh, we'll choose the technologies that are, you know, aligned with our values and things, fingers crossed. If we don't get a link, it doesn't matter. We, we, we still think it's a great placement for, uh, for the client because we've contributed to the knowledge graph uh, for our client. As an example, right, here's, a, here's a great use case. We've got a client right now who, they, I think they probably had like, three, they're a SaaS brand, they have three main product lines. I've changed these numbers up, and, uh, but they have acquired a couple more businesses. So they've added additional complementary products to their suite of tools. Now, if you go to Bard or ChatGPT, and you and I, I did this as a demonstration on uh, on a recent call for them, and I asked the the model, "What does this brand do?" and it, it all it came out with was the old offering that this brand have, and and their whole strategy now is about pushing forward and a full suite of applications for this particular niche of software solutions rather than just the specific couple that they were founded on. Our job now is to help them change the the model's opinion of this brand or its perception of this brand by feeding it these other signals. So when we're doing PR now, we're not just doing PR for humans, we're doing PR for the algorithms, for the for the AI as well. Because if the AI better understands what this brand does, then if I go and, and, and ask my AI assistant to give me some software recommendations, we want, you know, our client wants to be included in those if it's relevant. So now we have, we're doing a whole load of campaigns and link building, of course, but just content, guest appearances on podcasts and panels and conferences and things like that, because uh, the more they talk about these new products, the more over time the models will be asso will associate them with you know, the, the broadened scope of solutions that they offer. Another great use for uh, something like this uh, from your client's perspective would be like if, let's just say that it's not a linked mention, it's unlinked, Still, it's great, as you said, for the AIs and for all these other reasons. And it's a great mention for their uh, for inclusion on their press page, too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's just a additional credibility and, and legitimacy to their uh, prospects who are already on their website. Yeah. Those logos that we see on, on the sites, that's we want to help our clients for various reasons. EAT, of course, being a big one, which is only going, going to become more important as AI develops and becomes more mainstream, you know, we've got two, two main considerations with AI to think about right now. There's us using the tools, uh, AI tools to do SEO, but then also the algorithms are of course going to have to react to us using those tools. Because of course, SEOs, we're inquisitive, experimental folk who like to find ways around and, you know, um, hacks and, and, uh, and things to, uh, to increase ranking, or certainly some, some SEOs do, of course, and those boundaries will be tested. So the algorithm is going to have to then react to, you know, like great content used to be all, uh, all you need. And then in future content, the, the bar for content, you know, just basic copy is, um, is, is lower. So how do we, the, the, you know, the, the search engines and the social media platforms, they've got a, a big job on their hand, even YouTube, for example, because we'll be able to spin up a video with one prompt, publish it, post it, goes live on YouTube. The algorithms need to, they're going to need to learn how to surface the, the videos that we actually want to want, uh, watch. So, yeah, um, so there's that. And then, yeah, so there's AI being used by SEOs and then a AI being incorporated into, into search and social. So um, I've forgotten what the... The train of thought was there, but... in interesting times. You know, this reminds me of uh, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. Uh, a lot of folks misquote it as being survival of the fittest, but it actually is survival of the most adaptable. So if you can be more adaptable than your competitor as things are evolving with AI and, and technology and, and, and in general, you can be ahead of, of the pack and, and you can survive. But if you're not adaptable, 
you're just really fit. You go into the gym and so forth, but you're, you're, you're kind of a dinosaur in the way that you're approaching things. You, you're going to get eaten. Yeah. And it's seen it time and time again with each revolution. doesn't mean it's been replaced. It just got better and quicker, right? Example of the combine, combine harvester, you know, before we were manually hacking away to, to, uh, to harvest crops. And then now a combine harvester can do a whole field in, in a fraction of the time. So we need to need to be adaptable. Um, and that's what you know, we're doing at Seeker now is regularly having training and doing a lot of R&D on AI and uh, rolling out f uh, for our clients. And um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, you know, something we talked about before uh, recording was uh, you'd mentioned, listened to a couple of episodes recently on this show. Uh, one with Dixon uh, Jones talking about entities, one with Pamela Wilson talking about content marketing and, and the use of AI in content marketing. And, and you had a really interesting idea about kind of connecting the dots between uh, those two topics. And I just want you to share that for our listeners benefit too, because it's really creative and it just shows an example of how outside the box you are in your thinking and uh, applying these different strategies and ideas and technologies in novel ways, which I think that makes you irreplaceable. Like an AI can replace a lot of different kind of people and, and, and uh, job functions, but where it doesn't really work well is to find novel connections between disparate uh, ideas or systems or topics. And you definitely have that. So I wanted to have you share a little bit about what you were thinking about entities and, and, and AI and content marketing. Yeah, so they, they were two great episodes that really got me thinking. Somebody I've learned from for the past 10 years, the, the science of links um, is a often, uh, nowadays often overlooked part of link building. I love all the creative work that we do, but understanding the why is really important. And I think uh, Dixon helps to teach that. So I've always enjoyed listening to or learning from, from Dixon. The discussion on content as well and AI, that was thought provoking and it got me thinking because you, you presented this problem about your start here page. And I th as I was listening to the episode, I thought, hmm, how would I, you know, how would I approach this or what opportunities are there available? And it just got me thinking about what a gold mine of knowledge that you've got. You've got e e a literally EAT content. So just for the the listener who's not familiar with EAT or E E A T now it's called. That's mentioned by Google in the quality rater guidelines that they give to their their quality raters, their human reviewers, and it's experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. So just wanted to make sure everybody is uh, on the same page in terms of what you're talking about. But yeah, no, go ahead and proceed. Content of that nature is what's going to really stand out in future. So AI can't, can't produce experience or reiterate it. You know, the expertise, of course, yes, because it's got the combined knowledge of every single expert ever to have ever written anything, or it certainly will do one day. And not only... You know, that knowledge is then you know, it's all passed back to the uh, to the AI. So, yes, you could argue that it has that it could win on uh, expertise. Authority is I don't know about that because it's also using the amateurs and the charlatans. <laughs> like it's all in the it's in the mix and in, 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 in the training data. Very good point. Uh, and actually, maybe that leads on to the next letter, the authoritativeness. And that's where the, like the weighting of is this person qualified to speak about this topic? Have they got qualifications? Have they got um, the professional background? Have they got the research, uh, et cetera? So that's, that's how the models need to evaluate um, the, what, it, what it's being trained on itself. And then again, that leads on to trust as well, like votes of trust from other authority figures, which is why, why PR is going to become even more important in future, as well as the sort of content that you're producing, you and your guests are producing here uh, on this show, because there's experience in there, there's authority, uh, there's, there's, there's trust, all of, the, all of the elements, all the elements there are embedded in this content. Going back to the to the real life, real life scenario. You do the transcripts, which is great because then it can be picked up by search results. If someone's searching for a certain thing, uh, it shows up, which is uh, fantastic. But then, you know, at the moment, you've got these vertical, vertical columns of, of content. But if we start to slice this content up laterally, 
Uh, we've already talked about a number of different topics on uh, on this podcast, and your your other guests do too. So let's say you've got multiple guests that have all talked about, let's say, meditation. Uh, as an example, and they've all got different perspectives, they've all got different experiences um, on, on meditation. So if you can then slice your content up laterally and take all of the all of the meditation segments across all of the guests and then use that to then train a model, you can output fresh content, summarize content on, let's say, meditation or any other subject, let's say psychology of marketing, for example, if, if that's been mentioned and discussed it with various uh, guests you can not only are you combining it to then go and create fresh content based on you know very uh, experienced qualified people but you're also then you're combining different perspectives diverse opinions on on the psychology of marketing so you might have different guests that have approached it from different angles and then that's healthy that's healthy content if you had a a category on your site about the solid psychology of marketing and then it summarized an article and it said out of all of the guests that have appeared on uh, marketing speak x number have mentioned psychology of marketing here is a summary of what they have to say and then automatically generated below it is the time code links to each individual episode uh, where they can go and actually dive into the the citations uh, the actual source uh, of this summarized content if you build a model and automate this it can, and, and you hit go, it can go and do all of this. It can ingest all of the content, transcode, transcribe it, uh, understand it, extract the entities, then take the entities and then create content pillars and hubs um, for different topics. And you won't know what these are until you collect it all up because then it will tell you here are the most most commonly discussed entities on marketing speak and then match that up with search demand etc and then and then send get it to automatically output the content for for the site and you've got a gold mine then of new fresh con synergized content based on this huge database of uh, of knowledge that you've got i love that and it's so powerful to think about how you could micro niche down from, you know, let's say a topic, as you mentioned, meditation, which is certainly something I've talked many uh, times about uh, with different guests on my other podcast on Get Yourself Optimized. You can micro niche that into not just, let's say, transcendental meditation and then one on mindfulness meditation, but you could do like under mindfulness meditation, like walking meditation, walking meditation around labyrinths. And it's like you can go so micro niche because the AI is scalable to do that for you. And by having entities worked into this, that labeling of these different topics and subtopics and sub subtopics, it seemed to me like you could have infinite version of essentially Tim Ferriss's Tools of Titans book. If you're familiar with that, it's based on a whole bunch of recommendations from his guests over the years. You can do that like on steroids. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And you can even then go super niche and actually super personalize is even make some sort of chat interface to interact directly with the content. And then people can, uh, you know, people are building knowledge spaces now on their, you know, our SaaS brands, uh, their own training chatbots. Well, why not apply this to your, to, you know, to this wealth of content, this knowledge that you've got, and then people can come and ask marketing questions and draw on the combined knowledge of all of the speakers that you've ever had on the show and get a personalized output um, tailored to their exact particular prompt or, or question, you know, like diving into certain elements of, you know, meditation. And then, yeah, the output will be personalized to each individual or even spinning it out and then creating videos um, automatically. We'll be able to do that. Or going back to the interfaces, the platforms, you put on your mixed reality headset and it actually follows you around as you're going through your day. You're going on a pitch. Let's say I was just about to go on a pitch or I've come on a podcast today with you. I'm pretty sure uh, I've heard on this podcast myself, you talking about public speaking and you've certainly coached and helped me with these things. What if I'm going around with my uh, Apple Vision Pro version four on or something, and it's a, and it knows my calendar and it says you're about to go onto a a podcast. Here's a reminder of some tips um, to to help you with your appearance on this uh, podcast to articulate yourself, your body language, your tone, etc. And it's just like I'm getting my mind's being blown like just talking about the possibilities with uh, with this stuff. And but the key is you've got the 
you've got the source already. That's the hard part. You need that EAT content to be able to do all of this stuff. Otherwise, it's just fabricated and just a bit thin, really. And that personalization, I love that. Uh, that it's just so powerful to think about <laughs> your personal AI, your AI assistant, thinking about what's coming up for you during the day. And okay, you're going to be on a podcast. In my case, I'm the interviewer. And sometimes the guest doesn't know how to pronounce my name. They'll call me Steven. And then I have to correct them. If I didn't remember to tell them in advance before the recording, like, hey, by the way, my name is pronounced Stefan. We've known each other for many years. I don't have to bring that to your attention. My personal AI could know that and say, hey, you're, you're about to interview your friend here. So here's some tips for having a great interview. And then I don't have to include in that list of uh, my standard SOP, also re remind the guest uh, how to pronounce your name. The AI can just distill down the essentials that are specific to that interview or that meeting. I just, uh, the possibilities are endless. It's really exciting. And also speaking of uh, tailoring the experience, you uh, mentioned the start here page that we talked about in the, um, Pamela Wilson episode. What if it's a tailored start here page that is unique to the individual and they don't even have to issue any kind of prompts into a, a chat interface. It's just automatically tailored. I see that as in the future too. As a, yeah, very exciting time. Yeah. And that personalization is key there because at the moment you have to have that awareness of need. One of the flaws of search engines is you have to know what you want. You have to know what you need to search for, but if it's suggested to you before you've even searched it, because it's looked at your calendar, it's looked at your biometric, it's then able to say, hey, you could probably you know, benefit from learning about this today, or here's some content that might help you with what you've got coming up in your life. Yeah. And also basing it not just on your calendar and biometrics and so forth, but everything you've ever said, <laughs> or at least since you started recording it and allowing your personal AI access to it, right? We already see Otter and, uh, and other tools showing up as an additional guest in, in Zoom meetings, <laughs> taking the transcription and taking screenshots and, all, uh, and recording the video and all that. Imagine that on steroids and all of that huge repository of all those conversations and all the stuff that you've been consuming as well, the books you've been reading, the videos you've been watching, that's all fodder for the AI assistant as well. Allow access to everything. That's gonna be the, you know, when that prompt comes up, you know, it wants to access all of your old, I've got e email inboxes going back to, you know, when I was like 10 years old, right? And do I allow access to that All my social media profiles, my Google Drive, my Dropbox, my Slack, my messages, and, and the more it learns about you, the better it can can help you. There is a great article I was reading on futurism.com. This was based on Meredith Whitaker, and uh, she's the the head of, of the foundation that behind the Signal app. You know, Signal is a competitor to Telegram. And she was raising concerns about privacy and AI and how if you give access to an AI that has all this data about you, maybe it's even public. You didn't have any kind of, uh, you know, gates preventing the AI from using that information. Let's say it's just public tweets that you've been posting over the years. And AI could use that data against you and decide we're, we're not approving your loan request. Oh, oh, oh wait a second. Why? Uh, I'm sorry. That's a black box. We don't know. We just got a, a, a no from, from our AI that uh, makes these decisions. So I'm sorry. We, we can't give you that mortgage based in part on what you've been tweeting over the past 15 years or 10 years, whatever. Yeah. So your tweets could affect your insurance premiums, for example. Your insurability, your uh, credit rating, credit worthiness. Yes. So many things. I'll include a link to that article on futurism.com as well. All right. Well, I know we're at time here. So if our listener or viewer wants to work with you and your agency, uh, your awesome team at Seeker Digital, if uh, they want to learn from you about link building and AI and all that, where do we send them? 
Digital is where you'll find uh, my agency and my, my wonderfully brilliant team of content marketers, digital PRs, SEOs, link builders. We primarily work with e-commerce, SaaS and enterprise brands. We're a small agency, but our clients are generally quite long-term high value retainers. So if you think we can help, then I'd love to talk. We rank websites for mostly very very focused on the bottom of the funnel keywords we we've, we're trying to make seo like ppc in terms of its control but without the costs uh, and of course as we've uh, we've discussed a lot on this show i'm very into ai marketing ai seo uh, right now and um, we've got some super cool internal tools and um, solutions that we're rolling out for clients so if you'd like to learn more about that i would um, yeah we'd love to talk Thank you. And also, we're both big fans of Pitchbox. So if you're the listener who's working um, on link building and you have a team, pitchbox.com. It's amazing. Yeah, listener, I hope you take this information. You do something with it because this is not edutainment. This is a, a call to action. <laughs> you're supposed to do stuff with this. So I hope you are. We'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.